Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello and welcome back to New Books in Latino Studies, a podcast channel on the New Books Network. I'm David James Gonzalez, the host of today's conversation, and I'm pleased to be speaking with Mark Ramirez and David Peterson, authors of Ignored Racism, White Animus Toward Latinos, uh, published by Cambridge University Press in 2020. Mark Ramirez is an associate professor in the School of Politics and Global Studies and a faculty affiliate with the Center for Latinos uh, and American Politics Research at Arizona State University. He studies the role of democratic and non-democratic processes on political preference formation with a special emphasis on how these processes impact racial and ethnic minorities. David Peterson is the Lucan Professor of Political Science in the Department of Political Science at Iowa State University and former editor of the academic journal Political Behavior. He studies American politics, particularly elections, public opinion, and voting behavior. Hello, Mark and David, and welcome to New Books in Latino Studies. Thank you, DJ. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks. Well, it's a pleasure. Um, I must admit that uh, when I first saw your your book, I'm trying to remember if I saw it, whether it was in a colleague's office or just online, but both the title and the cover, which we'll have a picture of, you know, the cover's all blacked out and the uh, ignored racism really pops out, right? So uh, we'll get to that. But uh, it's just as soon as I saw this book, um, not too long ago, I think it's probably about a few weeks ago, I was like, that looks interesting. I got I to gotta check this out and, and see if I can get the two of you on the channel. So I thank you for making time and for being with us today. Yeah. To start, I'm hoping if the two of you can just tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, maybe we'll, let's begin with Mark um, and then uh, David. Yeah, so I um, grew up in Santa Cruz, California. I came from a, a very apolitical background and just sort of randomly ended up in taking some college courses. And I became very interested in just sort of my peers who were – you know, very political, oftentimes very biased. And I was just trying to get an understanding of where their attitudes came from, why they had such strong beliefs, why they sometimes uh, wouldn't budge from beliefs that seemed to be um, fairly wrong, flat out wrong. And, and I became interested in studying public opinion that way. And I think having sort of the apolitical background made me sort of gave me an advantage in terms of doing more objective social science research. Um, and ended up going to graduate school at Texas A&M University, where I got my PhD studying with Dave, um, who was my dissertation advisor. Um, and then uh, quickly spent a year at Washington University in St. Louis as a postdoc before moving to uh, Arizona State. Great. Thanks for that. Thanks for letting us know about that connection. Uh, I have to admit, it was kind of warning my background, the connection between the two of you. And so it's it's great to hear that. Uh, David? Yeah, uh, I grew up in... Uh, basically the suburbs of Minneapolis up in Minnesota. Um, I went kindergarten uh, through PhD within a hundred miles of Minneapolis. I uh, went to a small liberal arts school named Gustavus Adolphus college. Uh, and then the university of Minnesota. Um, that was, you know, that's my upbringing. That's, that's where I spent the vast majority of my life. And then my first job was Texas A&M. Uh, so I was still staying, you know, really close to I-35, but moving to Texas was a little different than Minnesota. Um, you know, I, I also sort of grew up in an apolitical family. Um, but I was always interested in politics in particular, I was always a sort of campaign junkie. Um, and when I got to college, I sort of figured out that, you know, we could use the tools of social science to try to understand campaigns and elections and why people think the way that they do. Um, and so I was lucky to have undergraduate mentors who could, who could help me understand that. Um, and then uh, good graduate mentors as well. Uh, went to a and spent nine years in Texas, which uh, as a Midwesterner wasn't exactly what I was looking for. And so when Iowa State had a position available here, um, I moved up here in uh, 2009 and have been here since. Great. Thanks for that. Um, I, pretty, I appreciate both of you mentioned you come from apolitical families. Uh, I kind of, uh, I can, that resonates with me. I, mean, I remember, you know, when I finally kind of, became a little aware, I guess, politically much more as an, a young adult. And, um, and this inevitably happened by taking, you know, ethics, what we consider ethics studies type classes, Chicano Latino studies classes. I remember asking my parents all these questions about, you know, just 
what I was learning about these events and, and politics and, and, but more so reflecting on my background that I felt like I too kind of came from this background where my parents were, um, I think they, they kind of more lived their politics as public educators. Uh, they never really pointed that out to me. I've come to kind of learn that that was their way of, of living their views. Um, but, but we didn't really have political conversations or really, I don't remember, you know, really paying much attention or watching elections and stuff like that uh, growing up either. So I need to see the connection there as well as, um, you know, that kind of overarching question of, of uh, that both of you mentioned of being interested in why people think what they do. Right. And how that connects to political behavior. Uh, and uh, I think that can that really resonates with with a lot of us, certainly. So uh, with that, I mean, let's just jump into the book and, and get into first, um, if we don't mind, let's talk about the title, uh, which, again, is very striking to me, uh, particularly, you know, ignored racism, but the full title, ignored racism, white animus towards uh, Latinos. So if maybe I can lead this a little bit, if uh, you can, we can use this as a segue into talking about the book. Uh, what is it that you mean by that? that kind of those first big bold letters ignored racism. What have, what have we missed here? Yeah. I, I think that when we talk about the, the impact of sort of white animus towards Latinos, it tends to be in the domain of immigration policy, particularly in political science, the focus has been there. Uh, and what's been ignored is that the wider impact that this racism has um, on other issues. And so that's a, a big theme in the book. Um, also ignored is sort of just trying to understand the ways that whites express animus towards Latinos. Um, so for instance, a big motivation in, in writing the book was issues of measurement. Um, so a lot of ways that, that sort of white animus towards Latinos are measured, suffer from social desirability bias. People don't want to answer the questions, honestly, um, things like, would you, be opposed to having a relative marry a Latino Hispanic? Um, how do you feel positively or warmly towards Hispanics, right? You know, so people mm -hmm. don't necessarily want to give an honest answer to those questions in the face of a survey researcher. Um, alternative measures such as stereotypes, they were largely developed um, with African Americans in mind. So you might be asked, you know, do you think Latinos are lazy? Are they intelligent? Are they trustworthy? Um, and those don't really capture in our mind the dominant ways that whites think about and express animus towards Latinos. Um, and so we're really missing sort of how that animus is, is, is expressed. Um, you know, you can really see that problem when you think about those stereotype measures in regards to actually Asian Americans, right? So if you answer those questions and you say, you know, Asian Americans are trustworthy, Asian Americans are intelligent, and they're hardworking, you know, that doesn't mean that you feel positively have no prejudice towards Asian Americans. It just means that we didn't ask the right questions, right? We're not asking the right stereotypes for that racial groups. And to a lesser extent, that applies to Latinos as well. A lot of uh, the measurement in social science research doesn't ask the right questions. And so we really wanted to get at what are the right questions to ask. Thanks for that. David? Yeah, I mean, in part, I think what we're trying to get at with the idea of ignored racism uh, and, and what's sort of ignored in the title is, is like Mark is Mark like Mark said, but um, you know, it's it's in in some ways I think about it as as in contrast towards racism directed towards African Americans, right? So mm -hmm. we have a long and rich and detailed academic literature on why whites hold the stereotypes or the negative attitudes about. Uh, African Americans that they do, and in political science in particular, how that helps structure the party system, attitudes about a whole host of other issues. And there hasn't been that same degree of attention about what whites are thinking about Latinos, like Mark said, except for immigration, right? So we know that immigration has been, been framed and thought about as immigration from Mexico, Central America, South America. And so it's been thought of and framed in terms of Latinos. But that's not the only part of American politics where that has been a piece to, to the discussion. And, and as Latinos are, as we all know, right, a growing part of America and making up a larger proportion of the population, in part, we think it's important because it's likely to then play a more important role as well. Gotcha. Gotcha. So it's, I mean, it is actually that, right, this is a a type of racism that is unique to Latinos, right? And that perhaps what, what clouds this for us is we're so used to seeing racism in a, a black-white kind of dichotomy 
uh, or binary in the United States. Uh, so if you can tell us what is then, um, you've mentioned the term Latino racism, ethnicism, and we're talking about these terms animus and ethnicism rather than just flat out racism. So can we get into a more kind of concrete definition of, of what this is? What is this? How do we define Latino or how do you, how are you defining Latino racism uh, and ethnicism? Yeah. So, I mean, I mean, technically, you know, Latinos are, are categorically classified as white in terms of racial category. And so where we try to make that distinction, right. It's, I mean, it's really vague, right. So a lot of Latinos will classify themselves as white. Some of them don't, and, you know, where the actual classification is, is, is really subjective to, to, to the individual. Um, and what we find that's really happening is, is that whites, um, are not just expressing sort of animosity towards Latinos in terms of racial group. Um, and they're, they're confused about the racial group. Uh, uh, it's also, they're expressing animosity towards sort of what we think more of as long lines of ethnicity. Um, that is the sort of the culture and sort of traditions and way of life of Latinos and those sort of, uh, cultural biases play a large role in how whites express animus. Gotcha. Yeah. David. Yeah, I don't have I don't have a whole lot to add to that. Mark did a nice job describing it, right? And and I mean the one piece that I want to sort of push uh, a little bit further is right. You know, as Mark said, right? We we tend to categorize Latino as an ethnicity and not a race. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's you know the the right way as a social scientist to think about it. But when we're thinking about how others are thinking about it, right? So when people are holding this uh, animus. Uh, towards Latinos, that animus has become, in the minds of whites, racialized, right? So, um, you know, we, the three of us, and the, probably most of the listeners, get the distinction between race and ethnicity. A lot of people don't. And so mm-hmm. um, that's in part what we're trying to capture with this as well, is that it's been this sort of racialization of, of Latinos in the minds of whites. Right. Great. Thank you. And let's get into that just a little bit further in regards to like that mixture of racism and, and ethnicity. And particularly, like, where did where do these ideas then come from, right? You spend like the first, I believe, the first chapter of your book, kind of talking about that this is this is not disconnected from our past or from our history, and so these ideas that you know shape ideas of both race and ethnicity and what those should be and or what it means to be American or white, right? Um, how do those type of views impact uh, white perceptions of, of Latinos? Yeah. So, so as you say, it really does come from, from history. And even as we note in the book, sort of the, the colonization of sort of uh, Native Americans and the mixture of bloodlines with uh, Spanish and other, you know, um, European settlers and how those, uh, those sort of mixed race, those mestizo populations were, um, defined and and what they were and were not allowed to do right so you had uh, purity of blood laws that uh you know prevented these mestizo people from being in certain occupations from holding political office and you know when you constrain people systematically like that uh you know you, you think about your mass publics they sort of see the outcome of that constraint they see the outcome of that discriminatory behavior but they don't necessarily see why that behavior comes about in the first place. Um, so, you know, for instance, you know, it's, it's really like the case of uh, attribution bias in psychology. They describe this happening all the time, right? Uh, when you fail at something, you tend to attribute your failings to systemic factors. It was, you know, say you're a driver's teacher that caused you to fail your driver's test. It wasn't your own poor driving. But when you see somebody else uh, fail at something, you tend to attribute that failing to them, the individual, right? And so we see this a lot through history where like laws and institutional racism are, are created, that laws are created that discriminate against a certain group, particularly Latinos in the cases that we're, we're looking at here. And, you know, whites only really observe the outcome of that, which is what happens to Latinos from the discriminatory institutions. What is the effect of those institutions on Latinos? How does it affect their behavior? And so it leads to perceptions among most whites to think that Latinos are somehow failing in some regard, right? Uh, they're placing the attribution of blame on the Latinos themselves rather than sort of the institutions. Um, and so it leads to the creation of, of various stereotypes um, and, and different ways of how whites today even express animus are based in sort of these uh, discriminatory institutions in the past. Thank you. Great. 
Right. I like the, that the notion of that Latinos are failing, right? That they're failing at something. And so um, what is it that they're failing at? You know, what is the, the, that perception, you know, that comes from these ideas of race and ethnicity that shapes, uh, as you're talking about, that is the, the racialization of Latinos. I mean, if there's something we need to point uh, or that they're pointing their fingers at, what are Latinos failing at? Yeah. So I mean, we give uh, lots of examples in the book. The main themes is, is, you know, one that you mentioned earlier was the simulation. Um, right. It's you're, you're creating laws that discriminate or tell Latinos that they can't really be themselves, um, that they need to be this other thing. And then you're criticizing them or, you know, whites are criticizing them when they can't sort of just naturally be this other thing. Right. Um, you know, it really is kind of extreme example is like, if you told an ant to be a bird and then you complain that the ant isn't a very good bird. Um, right. I mean, that's essentially what happens with institutional discrimination. And, and, and so you, you make the claim Latinos don't assimilate well when, in fact, you know, the social science evidence is, is suggesting that actually when given a little time, they assimilate quite quickly um, into the United States. But, you know, that's one example Or you know, when you take away somebody's, you know, economic livelihood because you change the rules or you take away their property, things that are things that were happening to Latinos in, in the past, um, or you send them to a, a school that's not as good as the school that the white kids are getting. Right. And they come out being, uh, you know, more poor, less educated, doing more menial jobs because of the system that led them down that path. You know, then you can complain when, you know, you might complain that that they're sort of you get this narrative of Latino criminality, right? Mm -hmm. um, and Latino poverty, that they're lazy. And so the stereotypes develop, um, you know, like, like, as I was saying before, because I don't think a lot of whites in, in sort of the mass publics understand the institution, the institutional discrimination that's causing Latinos uh, to sort of behave the way they do. Um, and oftentimes it's, it's not even that. It's just sort of a, a disregard for somebody else's culture, um, which is also at play here. Thanks. Uh, David, can you speak to the aspect that, um, like I was particularly interested in the use of the term white animus as opposed to, opposed to you know, racism. I mean, racism is in the title and racism is in your term, LRE, Latino racism, ethnicism. Um, but I think uh, what we're kind of currently talking about, right, this, the perceptions of failed assimilation, you know, kind of pointing the finger at Latinos at not doing something is, you know, what leads you to use this term animus as opposed to, you know, that this is just old fashioned racism. Yeah. I mean, part of what we're seeing is that, right, these aren't just sort of value neutral stereotypes or positive right, right. stereotypes, right? These are things that are inherently negative, right? So when it's the, as Mark said, the lack of uh, assimilation or the perception of criminalization or of, uh, lower levels of education, um, when there's hostility towards the use of Spanish, um, right? This isn't, this isn't neutral. This is a, an active negative dislike of, of Latinos by whites. Um, and, and animus was the word that sort of stood out to us or that sort of, that, that sort of tried to capture that, um, noting that it is again, this sort of more complicated than just simply racism. Um, but it does have this sort of cultural, uh, and, and ethnic, uh, ethnicity piece to it as well. That is sort of all bundled together. Great. Perfect. Um, so I, I, my next question goes to, I mean, you're, you're a social scientist, you're a political scientist, uh, you know, you got to figure out a way to test and measure this thing. Right. Um, how did you do that? Yes. So the first thing we did was, you know, as we mentioned, we looked through sort of the history of Latinos to look at the dominant ways they have been sort of portrayed. So this meant calling through, say, old newspaper articles, um, say, city, you know, city minutes of different meetings and looking at sort of what kind of uh, narratives were, were, were surrounding sort of Latinos in, in these communities. Um the, then we moved into the modern era where we decided to look at focus groups and we looked at um, a wide range of recent focus groups from, I think, 2000 to, to the present time um, where there was any conversation about Latinos. Um, so some of the conversations were about Latinos in, say, college campuses. Um, some of the Latinos were about the relationship. Some of the focus groups were about the relationship between Latinos and policing in a specific community. Um, others were about sort of just the integration of, of Latino workers in, say, maybe small rural communities, sometimes large communities, cities like L.A., Minneapolis. 
And so we compiled a large number of focus groups and then we just sort of coded through the um, discussions um, that, you know, ordinary citizens were having about Latinos, um, discussions that were unguided by our motives um, because other people were conducting these focus groups. Um, And we just looked at the way that that people discuss Latinos to try to come up with sort of what are the ways that sort of predominate these discussions that seem to uh, fit with both the past as well as the present sort of or present understanding of, of sort of white animus and, and prejudice. Thanks, Mark. Great. Um, and I, this this is leading me to think about what you you had both mentioned earlier about um, you know asking the right questions to to find this out. I mean, so what was that? Can you go in a little more in, into that process of how did you learn? Because you mix, use a, uh, you mentioned you use a, a ser- series of both focus groups that were were conducted on someone else kind of doing a more meta analysis. You did some surveys, you did a lot of other stuff. So how, how did you learn to refine and, you know, ask the right questions, so to speak, to, to see clearly what you were identifying as this distinct form of, you know, belief system, you know, uh, affecting people's views on political issues that, that affect Latinos. This took us a while. Um, you know, it was a little bit of trial and error. Uh, it was a little bit of uh, leaning on how other people have measured other uh, questions about race or ethnicity, um, and so it, you know we we um, there's some some well established uh, scales for measuring, say uh, uh, what we alternately call symbolic racism or racial resentment, um, and you know we know how those questions perform, we know uh, what the scale looks like and how it works, um, and so we sort of molded our questions. Taking that content that right that we'd uh, uh, taken from the reading of the focus groups, um, from you know sort of our understanding of the stereotypes about Latinos that whites hold, and uh, shifted existing questions to, to what we wanted. And and one of the things that shows up throughout the book though is that it does evolve a little bit, right? So part of it was then reaction from the scholarly community. So we had some early results that um, had some early questions. Uh, you know, one of the questions, um, had, uh, a reference to immigrants in it. Um, and we were using it to try to explain attitudes about immigration. And so when we presented it to some other scholars, they're like, well, you know, you're cueing people about immigration. So of course it's going to matter. So then we tried some other things. And so we tried, you know, subtly changing the question wording to remove immigrants from it. Um, and we just sort of iterated, um, we also then took what we knew were other measures that might be similar. So, like I said, that racial resentment uh, scale about attitudes about African Americans. There's well established questions that measure ethnocentrism, which is a sort of general attitude or a general animus towards other groups. It's not targeted at a specific group, but it's a sort of more general attitude. Um, and we tried to parcel out to say, all right, is what is what we're measuring with our questions and with our, our scale, is it distinct? Are we just capturing, you know, is this just a measure of being conservative versus being liberal? Is this just a measure of ethnocentrism? And we tried to sort of, you know, using a fair amount of stats, tried to figure out the uniqueness of our scale and our measure as it tapped into our unique concept. Great. No, and I appreciate that. And a lot of the discussion, you know, I will say in, in the book, I mean, that's what most of it is, right? It's, uh, and I pr- appreciate how thorough, you know, that effort was to make sure, okay, you know, that we are, that you are seeing what it is you're look or you're testing, right? Uh, the appearance of Latino racism, ethicism, rather than, right? Is this just, can this be explained away by geography? Can this be explained away by political partisanship, right? And that uh, we'll get into some of these issues that, it, it seems clear, right, throughout the book, you know, that there you're seeing, uh, as you state here, what is, you know, white voters expressing a coherent belief system, right, through various ways of making comments, uh, you know, uh, in, again, a focus group or responding a certain way to a survey, you know, that, that where the perceptions of its impact on Latinos um, can be seen, right? And um, so... If, if you don't mind, if we can get into some of these these issues, uh, you've mentioned immigration earlier. That's probably the, the first one that pops up to everyone's mind. Um, but uh, if not, you know, let's, let's just begin that um, with what are white viewers views on or sorry, white voters views on immigration policy and, and how did this again, become clear that what you were seeing in their responses for certain types of immigration policy, that it, it provided evidence for 
this belief system that they had about, again, Latinos being just simply failed at uh, assimilation uh, or unwilling or unable to adapt to American cultural norms and practices. Yeah. So we looked at um, predominantly two surveys. One was uh, to 2014 and the other in 2016. These are uh, sort of national samples. Um, and we asked sort of a range of different immigration questions, such as increasing the number of border patrols along the U.S.-Mexican border. Do you want to find businesses that hire illegal immigrants? Should police be allowed to question anyone they think may be in the country illegally? And the first thing we find is, you know, you see pretty even splits on most of these questions. And a lot of times you see, um, you know, just maybe slightly more support for sort of the, the, the pro-immigrant position um, for a lot of these questions. Um, it kind of makes you think that the debate that you see in the news is a little bit skewed. Um um, beyond that, you know, we, we then tie these questions to our measure of Latino racism, ethnicism in sort of what we think is the sort of typical way to do this through uh, what are called regression models. We're looking at the effect that Latino racism, ethnicism has independent of other factors that we know explain um, white attitudes towards these immigration policies. So not only things like, you know, education, age, um, income, but also partisanship ideology. We had measures of racial resentment towards African-Americans. So, you know, as Dave was mentioning, our measure of Latino um, racism, ethnicism is distinct from, you know, racial um, prejudice towards uh, blacks in this case. Um, we had a, a measure of, of cultural preferences. So do you think that the sort of culture and ways of the United States is better than those of other countries? Um, so we're not just measuring, uh, you know, so we're, so we're showing an effect of Latino racism, ethnicism independent of people's preferences for culture, um, as well as the percentage Hispanic change. So it's not just um, that people are experiencing what we think of as a realistic group conflict with Latinos. They're not just um, objectively or, or physically threatened by Latinos are not seeing more Latinos in their communities. It's simply that they hold this subjective belief about um, Latinos independent of these other factors that I was mentioning. And we show that uh, Latino racism, ethnicism has one of the, the strongest effect really across um, all these different types of immigration policies um, for uh, both of these, these election years. Yeah, you know, it was really fascinating for me to read, you know, the, the you know, first how you, you know you contextualize in the beginning of the, the chapter that addresses you know the immigration issue, um, you know, and you kind of give that the history of the you know, early two thousands, right, and this whole shift of viewing immigration policy as as, as national security, um, but also that comment that you meant you, you made there, Mark, about that people like hold these views, you know, even if they live you know with with no really viewer interaction with Latinos. And, and so it made me think of the, you know, the power of the media and the role of the media in, in shaping this belief system. And perhaps Dave, would you mind, um, you know, speaking to that, you know, about, again, the role of the media, the power of the media in shaping this belief system uh, that, that whites then bring into the voting booth with them. Yeah, this shows up in a couple of different places in our, in our work, right? So we do try, as we're tracing the history of uh, discrimination towards Latinos, and in particular the way or, or or the ways in which whites would have perceived Latinos, right? A lot of what we're noting is that the national media coverage, when they talk about Latinos, tend to disproportionately talk about things like crime and immigration, um, and or you know the flip side also when they talk about immigration, when the media talks about immigration, when the media talks about crime. Uh, that's the uh, Latinos are substantially more likely to be mentioned than uh, as they as Latinos are as a proportion of the population, right? Um, and so there's the this this sort of national framing about uh, two whites, right? The, the 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 ways in which the media talks about Latinos that whites consume, uh, that consume the media. Um, it it has these things, these frames, these ideas, and these stereotypes embedded. Um, and, and part of, I think what, what sort of also is a piece to this is that, you know, like, as you know, to large portions of the country, um, whites in large portions of the country don't have much interaction with Latinos. Um, and so much of what they get in trying to understand or, or form a, an opinion of, of, or an attitude uh, about this are going to be these stereotypical media depictions of Latinos that are going to tap into these longstanding institutional structures. Right. And uh, which is, 
I mean, it was just both striking. It's, it's frankly, it's frankly frightening for me. I mean, particularly understanding how, you know, polarized and partisan our media landscape is and that the, right, the likelihood is that most people, right, are perhaps securing their news from uh, one, right, channel or at least a series of, um, uh, you know, sources, all that basically work to uphold a, you know, particular partisan view, right, that, you know, there are people that are just getting inundated with that exact view, right? Latinos as failed assimilationists, Latinos as criminals, and that's all they, they may hear through their various media outlets and, and maybe even social networks, you know, both in person in their neighborhoods and online, that, uh, you know, it, it, it really presents something to them. But again, it's, it's happening kind of in this, this one sphere, you know, if you will, of, you know, public discourse where they're just not getting the rest of it either. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that sort of the inside baseball intellectual history of the book is in part, you know, we first started collecting the data for this in 2014. Um, and I think, you know, in our conversations, we thought this was an interesting idea intellectually. We thought it was an important idea. We thought there was, you know, here's something we don't understand very much. Um, and we weren't sure, you know, I, you know, I could speak for myself. I wasn't sure how big of a project this was going to ultimately end up being. Um, and then came President Trump, right? Yeah. And the, the, I mean, this was, we started this prior the 2016 election, prior to Trump coming down the escalator. But the ways in which he in particular talks about Latinos, and, and particularly in 2016, and the way that that was the sort of central part to his campaign made us realize uh, that, you know, this is, there's a lot here, right? And it's an expanding piece here. Um, you know, we, you know, we've talked a little, you know, we're talking about now, but we're talking about Im immigration. We have a whole chapter on, on crime that I'm sure we'll get to, but we also have a question on you know, voting rights or a chapter on voting rights in this. And a lot of that, um, is, you know, steeped in president Trump's rhetoric about voter fraud and illegal voting and the way that that gets framed as a question, um, that's, that's, taps into these stereotypes about Latinos. And, and um, you know, it's, it's a little bit different than the history of voting rights that we get taught or that we see, right? With the passing of John Lewis, we, we are reminded of the civil rights fights uh, that are tied with the history of African-Americans and the disenfranchisement of African-Americans. But there is this whole other piece about the disenfranch disenfranchisement of Latinos and the sort of current disenfranchisement of Latinos with things like voter ID laws, or at least the, the rhetoric about voter ID laws being about Latinos in, in so many ways. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and we can definitely, we'll get to those other two topics uh, next. I, the last thing I wanted to point out on just on this subject of immigration is, um, I mean, I appreciate towards the end of your discussion on that chapter and the conclusion, uh, you basically call out that, you know, um, future attempts at immigration reform have to take into consideration your research, right? And, and the policy implications of it, right? That, that there are deeply held beliefs about Latinos, um, particularly among white folk in the electorate, you know, um, that are ingrained, I'm quoting from the book here, that are ingrained in the historical memory of the nation and, too, are being amplified in today's mass media environment, right? Um, and that has to factor into uh, how policymakers and, and lobbyist interest groups are, you know, can even try to imagine how you begin to reform immigration, which, we, which we've seen has just failed at every attempt that's pretty much happened over the last decade Out, outside of, again, executive action. Uh, there's been virtually, there's been nothing, you know, that has actually, you know, appeared. You've had bills pass the House or a bill pass the Senate, but they have not been able to come together uh, to past comprehensive immigration reform. And it doesn't seem, you know, frankly, like any, any time in the near future that that's going to happen, you know, the makeup of Congress um, and, um, you know, the, the presidency exists to continue as they are. Right. So uh, I just, again, just point out appreciating that call, you know, that's something that kind of shook me when I read that, that, I mean, that's, that's right. It's something that really has to be factored into what is possible and attainable. Right. Yeah. And if you think about, you know, sort of the history of immigration policy in the U.S., the times when it's been sort of more on the successful end is the times when the public's been out of that discussion. Right. So it's going to be really hard to change these sort of ingrained um, attitudes. 
Um, you know, so, you know, in, in my view, maybe the best attempt is to go back to having this to be a, a discussion among sort of technocrats and, and policy experts. Um, and, it, you know, because that's that's the only time when I've sort of seen sort of, you know, you know inroads on this, even, you know, pre 9-11, when you had the discussion of immigration reform at the presidential level between George Bush and Susan State Fox, which we talk about a little bit in the book, right, you see them talking about increasing guest worker programs and doing some reform. And it looks like they're actually going to make progress prior to 9-11 on these issues. You know, the public really wasn't engaged in that. It wasn't on sort of the agenda. Um, and so to, to me, it's like, you know, how do you deal with this stakeholder who is who has these, you know, extremely racist views? And, and it, it, it's a difficult uh, to do that when when they're when they're part of the conversation. Yeah, you know, it's a fascinating comment because it makes me think of like some of the early research projects I got into when I was uh, an undergrad. And a lot of it was really, you know, over these aspects of, you know, the role of public opinion in shaping immigration policy. And uh, I did, a, you know, a few projects you know, that looked at like Prop 187, comparing that to SB 1070, um, looking all the way back to IRCA, you know, the Immigration Reform and Control Act, 1986, and comparing that to, to other things. And and with the, that's what you see. And it almost kind of, <laughs> I'm just kind of chuckling because I'm, I'm also kind of chuckling at the fact that I'm feeling nostalgic for what you just called for, you know, like technocrats to the adults in the room to kind of come back and like start figuring this out without listening to all the children. Um, because that's a lot of what you saw in like earlier immigration reform e efforts. It wasn't public opinion that drove uh, immigration policy. It was, you know, uh, you know, the policymakers, technocrats, et cetera. And, and the salience of the policy rose as the public, you know, got wind of it and started covering it, you know, like with Prop 187 and everything. But Prop 187 was, was not driven from the ground up, you know, by public opinion. Um, and that's California that I'm referring to, naturally, that kind of, right, the, the, the grandfather of the SB 1070, you know, show me your papers type legislation, all these sub-federal efforts, right, to intervene in immigration policy. But I, I mean, I kind of agree with you, you know, Mark, and I'm kind of like shocked in, in feeling it because I remember I like had the opposite view, right, when not too long ago, 10 or a little more than a dozen years ago, when I was doing this research, like, why aren't these politicians listening to people? And like, now we see it's a freaking mess, man. <laughs> you get, you get, uh, uh, what we have right now is, is there, there's no coherency. There's, there's no coming to the middle. There's no aspect of that. It, it seems at least because again, the attempts have repeatedly failed for over a decade to, to pass uh, comprehensive immigration reform, or even piecemeal legislation like the Dream Act, or, or something like that, right? Yeah, and it's it's easily the most anti-democratic thing I've ever said. Um, <laughs> and I'm normally, you know, I'm normally not like that, but it, it, you know, it's it's a tough issue, and there's no easy solution. Hey, thank you, I appreciate that. Well, we we mentioned uh, you mentioned criminal justice, uh, so let's get into that one, um, and maybe we can go into that issue by saying. Um, what are the differences that you noticed, right, between how LRE or Latino racism, ethicism among white voters shows up on the issue of policing and criminal justice uh, in regards to immigration? Because at least as I read it, there's a really super strong correlation, right, and predictability of LRE with the immigration issue. And it's a little more complicated. It shows up with policing and criminal justice, but it's, it, you know, if you can just, you maybe I'll just leave it for you to explain what it is you all found in that way. Yes. So, so you know, Criminal justice policy is one where we sort of say, you know, okay, oh, Latinos are not front and center here, right? The debate and the, the narrative of, of crime and crime news has always really been centered around African Americans with Latinos taking sort of a secondary role. And so naturally we find like the correlations between LRE and uh, different criminal justice policies, like wanting tougher sentencing, wanting, you know, increased law enforcement, um, you know, increasing sort of the, or allowing minimum uh, sentencing guidelines, um, allows judges to pass sort of uh, mandatory minimums. Uh, you know, these things are not, the relationship between LRE and, and these things are not as strong as they were with, say, immigration policy, but they are there and they are consistently there across these different issues. You know, even when we start controlling for and taking account of sort of how people feel towards other groups, um, partisanship, whether or not they're a victim of a crime and things like that. Uh, you know, so... That's that's sort of the, the overview of, of, of what we find there. The other really interesting thing that we found was we first set out to look at sort of crime news, right? Because we 
tend to have this idea based on the literature on African Americans that, you know, Latinos are probably somewhat overrepresented in stories about crime. And we find that they, they are, but not as much as African Americans. But what's really interesting is when you look at reporting of 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 uh, Latin American countries and you compare it to reporting of countries in, say, Africa or Asia in Europe, the reporting in the U.S. of Latin American countries tend to heavily focus on crime in those countries, substantially more than, you know, the, they cover crime in, say, Africa or Europe. You know, so Americans are getting a lot of news um, that these Latin American countries, these origin, origin countries um, are heavily infested with crimes and gangs and drugs. And that's sort of, you know, what their big takeaway is. That's what they're being being fed. Um, so naturally, that, that seems to play a strong role, we think, um, in how people sort of have this natural tendency to think of Latino criminality. Um, we don't really make the strong connection in, in the book, but, but it seems logical that it's there. Um, and that's a, that was a real big difference from what we've seen um, in sort of the portrayal of other um, ethnic groups and, and, and racial groups in criminal justice policy. Yeah, there's a section of yours on the media um, reporting crime. You got a really uh, interesting figure in here, 5.1, that that shows that disparity. You know, it shows the 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 racial makeup of crime news versus arrests, and you just see right how disproportionate you know uh, that is. Right, that the news disproportionately uh, focus less on white crime, um, whereas, you know, the, the, the amount of white arrests are, what, more than double, you know, that proportion of, of their coverage. And you have, you look at that for Latinos and African Americans, and it's, it's flipped, right? The, they are, again, disproportionately seen, uh, you know, in a negative light. And I appreciate your, your discussion there of Latin America, because that is so true. You, you, we hardly ever hear about central um, you know, America, uh, particularly El Salvador, Honduras, if, if they're not talking about MS-13 or some other type of criminal activity. And frankly, you know, Americans, I, I don't think, uh, and it's just a hunch, I can't prove it, but I just don't think they make a distinction, you know, between Latinos and Latin Americans. I mean, I, that's one of the first things I have to teach my students, you know, that, that Latinos are Americans, or these are people of Latin American heritage, right, in the United States. And there's always like this light bulb that goes on, or they just think the terms are synonymous sometimes. And so, I mean, I think it's entirely plausible, right, that that most Americans are not seeing the distinction between discussing um, criminality or whatever may be going on, negative effects in, in Latin America, as opposed to Latinos in the U.S., yeah, and it's certainly consistent with the large literature in, in criminology and, and sociology that, you know, crime attitudes, uh, you know, fear of crime, as well as, uh, you know, the policies people want to deal with crime are really, you know, socially constructed. They're constructed by people's um, viewership of the media much more than their actual experiences with crime, much more than what's going on in their neighborhoods. Um and so, you know, so we, you kind of put two and two together and then we think that's pretty much the story that's going on here. Um, maybe not as predominant as sort of crime reporting towards African-Americans and, and the role African-Americans play in criminal justice policy preferences. But Latinos are playing a significant role here, too. Right. And that's, you know, go ahead, Dave. No, I was just going to say, like your starting point for this whole conversation about criminal justice is that it's not as consistent um, as, as immigration. And part of that is because like we've sort of talked around a little bit, right. Whites have to be told that when we're talking about crime, we're talking about Latinos that, that, and, and I think from the, from the criminal justice literature and from others, right. If you ask a white person to picture a criminal, right. That the picture that they draw on their head is going to be racialized and it's likely that that person that they're going to imagine is going to be African-American. But when the media covers the criminality or, or covers Latinos as criminals, right, that helps, that shifts the way that whites are going to think about criminal justice and potentially who they're going to think about, who they're going to think about as that sort of archetype of a criminal. Right. Thank you for that. Uh, you know, the, the opening of the chapter, you know, on attitudes about punishment and policing is just, you know, I know that you're initially you're surveying the literature and I've read it and I've heard it and we hear it, but it's just so striking. Uh, I mean, the first sentence you have in here, the United States incarcerates a higher percentage of its citizens than any other nation in the world. I, I just don't think most Americans realize this, right? Um, because the first question that comes to my mind is, what the heck is wrong with us? You know, like, 
<laughs> I mean, how in the heck is this is this the case? More than 2.2 million Americans are currently behind bars in the United States, and then you go on to share the the disparities. You know that with uh, you know white men, it's one in 17 white men are incarcerated or imprisoned in some time, some way during their lifetime. For Latinos, it's one in six, and for black men, African Americans, it's one in three. I mean, it's just. I had to read those figures because they're just we're, – we're having this national conversation and those figures are just so striking. And I don't see how you don't read those or hear those figures and think, what is wrong with our system, right? Both in the number and the disproportionality of who we are locking up. Right? So uh, thank you for that. Um, I want to transition to kind of my last two questions, with you, which is you know both about – voter ID laws and voting restrictions in general and Latinos as, and have that segue into us, if, if you don't mind, talking about implications for, for this year, for the 2020 election cycle. So uh, either one of you can go first, but just to restate, you know, the, uh, what you found in regards to voter ID laws and voting restrictions and how this relates to LRE, Latino racism and ethnicism, uh, and um, as well as the implications for the 2020 elections. Dave? Yeah, the... Uh the one thing we shift to a little bit when we shift to the chapter that looks at voter ID laws is, um, and we do this a, a little a little bit in the earlier chapters, but this the the, the work on voter ID really focuses um, on a couple of experiments we ran. So um, you know what we're doing here is we're still getting a, a, a national sample of survey subjects. They're sort of taking your standard survey, but we're asking them in the voter ID question. We're asking them their attitudes and their levels of support for voter identification laws. These are laws that say you have to have some form of state issued identification. Um, in some cases, it's with an uh, with a, with a photo. Some it's without. Uh, you have to have that to be able to vote. Um, and in part, um, we know that uh, the you know attitudes about African Americans tend to predict voter ID laws, but prior to our work, there wasn't a whole lot, there wasn't anything about the, the ways in which animus towards Latinos uh, uh, shaped these um, as well. And so, you know, that's part of what we're trying to test here then is, um, you know, how, do, how does LRE help explain the ways in which people think about these voter ID laws? Um, as I mentioned before, right, the, the ways in which voting and access to the ballot gets described in America has a lot to do with voter fraud, with people illegally voting. Um, the the rhetoric that gets used by particularly right wing pundits, uh, you know, there's examples in the book that we point to of, uh, you know, that that um, Mexico is interfering. You know, sure, maybe Russia interfered in 2016, but Mexico interferes in our elections by sending people here to vote illegally, um, right? So the ways in which we talk about voter fraud in America tends to be there are people, right? And usually the reference is oblique uh, to people who are voting illegally, where the subtext is entirely it's immigrants. Um, and by which, of course, you know, the folks mean Latinos um, who are voting illegally. So in our experiment, what we do is we give people a little article to read where we either present them with a picture um, uh, of just a voter booth or a picture of a couple of African Americans voting or a picture of, of, of Latinos. Um, uh, got a voter booth that also includes a uh, vote here in Spanish or a vote phrase in Spanish. So it has that sort of Spanish cue as well. And then we add either uh, nothing to the article, a paragraph that says voter ID laws disenfranchise African Americans or uh, voter ID laws disenfranchise Latinos because African Americans and Latinos are less likely to have the appropriate state issued identification. Um, and the main thing we find is that LRE really has a dramatic inf influence on people's attitudes about voter ID laws. Folks who are higher, whites who are higher in LRE who hold more animus towards Latinos are much more likely to support uh, these voter ID laws, that, they, they, um, that those are the folks for whom this is a very important issue, that they, that they really support uh, uh, the, these, these needs for these restrictive voter ID laws, which have some pretty substantial effects on enfranchisement, right? So they tend to disenfranchise uh, uh, voters um, fairly systematically. Right. And uh, I think even, and particularly if you mentioned, you know, the, 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 the kind of watershed moment, if you will, that, you know, Trump's campaign has been, I mean, it's, it's not, it's definitely not happening in people's imaginations, you know, that where they're making the connections between 
kind of anti Latino racism, right? Um, and their perceptions of voting because the, the president flat out, that's what he says, right? I mean, he says these people, right? And he makes it a partisan thing. They, you know, they want, Democrats want illegal immigrants so they can go to the voting polls. I mean, which is absurd, right? Um, but but it, my point being, it's just that this is not something that's been cooked up in the imaginations of white people, right? <laughs> it is, no, right. They're, getting I mean, it through, they're getting it through politicians who are campaigning on these issues, quite literally, to restrict the vote, right? Uh, yeah, and, and uh, to a certain extent, they're not even shy about it, right? So there's a couple right. of quotes in the book that basically they said, where there are Republican elected officials who say, if brown and black people voted for Republicans, we wouldn't be in favor of these laws. <laughs> I mean, I'm laughing. I, I, I understand it's true. I just can't believe it comes out of their mouth. Like, it's like, I'm not, not naive, but it's... <laughs> you have to laugh or you'll cry. Yeah, exactly. Right? One, exactly. Well, let's talk about the implications. We'll to, to sort of, uh, I appreciate your time to wrap up. I mean, what are the implications, you know, for this, uh, you know, this year? with, you know, your findings in general. And I do want to emphasize, as you mentioned, uh, you know, Dave, that your book is the first to find, right, the significance of LRE in voter restriction laws, right? That first to really, you know, test, right, the impact of these negative views, anti-Latino views, uh, impacting people's view on voting restrictions. A lot of this conversation and studies has been focused on, right, anti-Black racism. And we've seen the Supreme Court, you know, cases since the striking down of uh, was it Section Seven of the, the Voting Rights Act, et cetera? Um, but that is quite significant of, of your work to to actually document and find this, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so, in terms of the sort of what's it going to matter for twenty twenty, um, uh-huh. I, I think I mean right. So, one of the things about our book is that the answer depends, right? So, um, you know, immigration it doesn't matter. That's in the minds of whites. Immigration is about Latinos. Crime is conditional. Right. You know, we have to uh, the, the, if the media frames it or if we in our experiments frame it as being about Latinos, then LRE matters uh, more. Um, voter ID tends to be um, it seems to be salient. It seems to be something that that is pretty consistent. Um, but in our, when we look at elections, the election has to be about immigration really for LRE to matter or it has. To, I mean, that's the one issue we picked because that's the one that's sort of consistently talked about. Um, and, and so that was the easy one for us to pick. But, right, but the election has to be about for anti-Latino attitudes to have a strong influence on, on, on whatever it's trying to explain. Right. So if it's immigration, that's sort of always the case. Crime, it's sort of conditional. And so if this election is still about immigration. Right. So if the ways in which we try to decide whether or not, you know, uh, whether or not we approve of Donald Trump is about his attitudes about immigration or his policies on immigration, um, then LRE is probably going to play a big role. Right. Because that sort of cues people. It helps people think, all right, what am I what am I thinking about going into this election? Oh, it's LRE, because that's what the candidates are telling me that is important. I'm a little skeptical that that's what this election is going to be about. Right. So, I mean, given the pandemic, given the economic collapse, given the ways in which racial justice is being talked about as largely racial justice concerning African-Americans, um, the for I think a lot of whites. Their attitudes about Latino just sort of drops down in terms of what they're thinking about when they vote. Mark might have a different opinion on that um, because we haven't really talked about this part. Um, But that's sort of my view as to what's going on going into 2020. Gotcha. Mark? Yes, I I think the big implication for the 2020 election is is this Latino racism, ethnicism is this sort of central belief system among it's a central note in, in, in a belief system for many white Americans. And it's sort of, as I see it, a glue that's sort of holding together um, what what we might think about as like a slate of issues and candidates that are on the ballot in 2020, um, from the presidential race to local races, to things like, you know, the voting rights issues, uh, the issues surrounding criminal justice reform, immigration, and these other things that we've talked about. Um, you know, and, and it's all sort of held together and, and connected through this this single belief uh, LRE. And, and we, sh- we should note that, you know, we, we argue that this is something that has grown out of history. So we, we believe, I think, that it's it's pretty uh, – that it's something that's been held for a long time by, by voters or some segment of, 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 of white Americans. You know, and our data actually goes back to 2014. That's when we sort of first have the, the first survey data on this. And so it's pre-Trump, 
Um, and so it's not just that elites are creating this attitude. It's that it was there and elites are more capitalizing on it. And that's sort of helping to bring sort of all these issues together and what I was referring to as a sort of single slate for the 2020 election. So, you know, in my view, it, it's, it's a really central belief in, in this election for, for many voters. Great. Thanks for that. Well, I, I want to, again, thank both of you for uh, your time, for coming on New Books and Latino Studies to discuss your book. It, very important book. I mean, very important findings. Um, I'm glad our listeners are, are getting an opportunity for this. Um, uh, I can't say it, it will be fascinating. It's both going to be like fascinating and terrifying to see how this plays out. Um, you know, what, what an election year this is going to be, as you mentioned, with, with everything else on the board, pandemic. Uh, you know, the economy, the way it is. I mean, uh, politicians, particularly Trump, but the GNC increasingly uh, politicizing, you know, the wall, all this stuff. It's just all, we're, we're just going to, we'll see how, uh, how things turn out. So thanks again for your time. And just again, great job on the book, Mark and Dave. Thank, Thank you, you very thanks much. For thanks for having us. Yeah, this has been a lot of fun. Thank you. 